Okay, well, why don't we get started then? And I'm going to introduce Bob Parks, who's our speaker tonight. We're kind of um, moving out of a strict plant discussion tonight, but certainly one that's going to be very enjoyable and informative, I'm sure, to you. That's going to deal with uh, one of plants' biggest friends, namely ants, wasps, and bees. I'm at the order Hymenoptera. And uh, Bob will be talking about those insects in some detail, but most importantly, he's going to be illustrating them with some absolutely fabulous photographs that he's taken mm -hmm. over the years. He's a terrific photographer. So Bob is a um, is an extremely talented entomologist and uh, insect photographer. He resides in Hereford, Arizona, near Sierra Vista, and has uh, been working on entomology-related issues in Southern Arizona for, for many years. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a superb photographer. His photographs have appeared in numerous scientific journals, uh, publications, um, more than 60, in fact. And um, in the past, he had worked, uh, he had worked previously at the San Diego Natural History Museum, and also in, uh, in Fort Collins at the Colorado State University through uh, contract work with the US Department of Agriculture. So Bob is a first rate entomologist and photographer. And he's gonna share with us tonight some of his uh, really fabulous photography. Um, the technical title of this talk is an introduction to the order Hymenoptera, which includes ants, wasps, and bees. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy that. So, Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, I'm going to start by saying that today we finally had some Hymenoptera in the yard. We saw <laughs> at least eight Arizona carpenter bees that were all males, and a Polistes dorsalis, a paper wasp. And so things are looking up. Of course, I've had uh, a couple of different species of uh, ants that are really interesting, at least to me, and they live here in the yard. And they, so to speak, at this time of year, they come and they go. Some days they'll be out, and other days they'll close their, you know, close the door, so to speak, to their nest, and you won't see them for a while. But anyway, let me go to my first slide. And most of these are taken in Cochise County. And this is Amophila macro. This is one of our largest Amophilas. And uh, I did a program, not, I think it was in January, and somebody got up and said, well, you're using all these scientific names. Well, it, uh, what I was afraid was somebody gonna say, like often happens, well, you didn't pronounce a scientific name right, but whatever. Anyway, um, I pretty much have to use the uh, scientific uh, names. There's just not that many common names as far as I know. So anyway, so here you have a Moffa macro with what's called a nododonid caterpillar. And she will insert this in, in her nest in a burrow. And uh, most Amophilas uh, collect more than one caterpillar. And uh, then they will, they're all paralyzed and then they will lay an egg on them. And, Eventually, the egg will hatch and the larva will feed upon the uh, caterpillars and so on and so forth. We're going now to the next slide. And this is Amophila puma rubra, in other words, a red legged Amophila. Here, in the scene, it's attacking a caterpillar. And recently, I saw on the internet. That nothing is known about this amophila. There's not certain what it does. Well, what it, the caterpillar that it's actually attacking is one of the uh, most major pests. It's a corn earworm caterpillar. And uh, here it's got the um, caterpillar on the ground and now it's stinging it. And they don't just sting, they have to sting brick precisely, very delicately, because they're going to store these caterpillars in a cell in the ground, and the immature, the egg, then will hatch, and it's going to feed upon 
the caterpillars, this species. And if the uh, caterpillar was active, it could actually crush or kill the very young uh, Amophila. And here we have uh, another one that's, uh, we have at least 20 different species of Amophila in this part of Cochise County. And this is Amophila uh, aberti. And she's simply uh, plugging up a nest. Her nest is already full of caterpillars of yet another species. And now we're going to a very common uh, Vespula pennsylvanica and it is a yellow jacket. And what's happening here is you have a, the flower, of course you can see, and all of a sudden these two uh, wasps uh, go onto it. What's, what happened is that you have an ambush bug and the ambush bug has captured a honeybee and these are social wasps and they, they don't pay any attention to the, um, to the um, phymata, to the ambush bug. And the ambush bug is quite capable of possibly even grabbing one of those. It's well armored and, and it, they kill numerous uh, stinging uh, insects. But anyway, so that's a pit that was a series of, on basically thievery. And then here you have, this was in Garden Canyon here uh, and uh, close to Sierra Vista. And you have a predatory fly and the fly is a uh, robber fly, it's a genus Afaria. And here you have a yellow jacket. Okay, well, a lot of the robber flies, we used to think that they would just grab a hold of a prey item and insert enzymes, which would allow them then, which would break down the tissue and then they would be able to suck it back up. But what's really happening now, just recently, they've uh, realized that uh, the, uh, affair, that the robber flies have venom glands. And what's interesting to me is that the venom glands are in the, in the thorax. So they, the, the venom travels down through the proboscis and into the victim, and it is almost instantaneously uh, just quiets, you know, and it quiets whatever prey item it might be. And the, um, you can see all this. All you got to do is look up rubber flies, uh, venom, whatever, and they've even called the venom a cillin. The cillin, uh, the rubber fly groups are called cillids. And then we have a mimicry. So most uh, uh, or a great many uh, wasps will mimic other wasps, but, and they especially mimic um, social wasps like the Vespula because they are the most aggressive uh, wasps because they have large nests and those nests are filled with their own kind and with uh, larvae and so on. So they aggressively defend that. Whereas the average like wasp, like this wasp here, a bembic species, is solitary. So that's a form of what's called Mullerian mimicry. And then here I was taking the pictures, and this was in the San Pedro riparian area. I was found an area where they had a colony, so to speak. They don't interconnect with each other, except for the males to mate with the females, of course. But here, what's happening is that female is coming in with a prey item, which is a serpent, a fly, and you have this little uh, kleptoparasitic, I think is the correct term, a little tiny fly, and it actually does not lay an egg on it, it larva posits, it lays a little tiny larva onto the prey item. So once the prey item uh, goes into the nest and is laid there by the adult, then the um, little uh, fly is going to be able to reproduce, I mean, to grow at the expense of the uh, wasp. And, and now here we have another picture of a Vespula of Pennsylvania, get a little bit better view. And this one is just simply sucking up uh, 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 fluid that has fallen on the ground from hummingbird feeder. 
And here is yet another wasp that mimics uh, the, the Vespids, Vespula. And this is uh, Pseudomazarus Vespoides. I used to see these where I grew up in San Diego County in the Cuyamaca Mountains. And this one here, though, is photographed in uh, near Fort Collins, Colorado, in the edge of the Rocky Mountains. This is a male. And their whole life cycle there revolves around uh, certain species of uh, penstemons. And you see the large, you see the long, elongate antenna, and they're kind of like on the end expanded. And here you have a mating period. You have the uh, male uh, covering the eyes, calming, but it's not just calming because there's other, even some of the bees do this. And uh, most of them have been studied in detail the uh, male wasp will secrete different types of pheromones, what, uh, whatever, that uh, calms or whatever uh, interacts with the female. And here is a pair uh, that I took at nighttime in their pen stemmas, and just like little sleeping bags, they're sleeping there. <laughs> you can see how, how relaxed they are. <laughs> Sessions of the legs, you know, they they are asleep and they do sleep like harder animals. You know, there's always going to be people that argue about some of these things. Oh, do they really sleep? Yeah, well, as far as I'm concerned, they do. And here is uh, by Surtees. This is a uh, uh, wasp uh, that captures um, stink bugs, and that's and. She mass provisions. She puts um, several stink bugs into a cell, lays an egg on them, and actually, a lot of times, they'll lay an egg on the first one. Um, but anyway, this was uh, up by Fort Collins. But this species is here, but we have another species here that's called Bicerides ventralis. It's much darker and a bit smaller. But uh, they're, for the mo most part, I believe that all, uh, all of them are. Um, stink bug hunters. And here you have uh, just a picture of one going into her, go, going into the ground into a cell that she's made. And she will take that stink bug in there and her young will, uh, one individual will feed on those. And here we have a uh, Polistes. And this is one that I've gotten stung by. I've got stung quite a bit, but I, this one, <laughs> has a really nasty sting. And when I got stung on my thumb, not close to the thumbnail, but the area underneath the thumbnail turned black. And finally, it, it went away after several days. But um, so here you have another uh, species that this one is known to be a mimic. It has several species down through Central America. There's one in Costa Rica in this genus. Uh, and I just put long waisted paper wasps, it's a common name there. And you can see that it has a, like a segment that's elongate between the rest of the abdomen and its thorax, but it's got the same exact coloration as Polistes comanches. Now you can go uh, up to Colorado, see the same uh, species of this long waisted wasp, and it will be at a different color. But anyway, getting back to the one. Uh, and uh, Costa Rica, the female uh, mimics a wasp of another genus, and then the male mimics the uh, yet another species of wasp in that same genus, but totally, totally unrelated. So the male and the female um, mimic different wasps. Um, and here's one of our most common. You see this one in the yard. Polistes major, it used to have a, uh, it had a slight name change. But anyway, here it's collecting fiber and that fiber is what will be made into a nest. And uh, here you see one that's came back to its nest and she's got the fiber there. And if, if you're patient and you can get used to these wasps and once they, they, they will get used to you and they, they won't be aggressive unless something unexpected happens. If you went up and, you know, just startle them or something, they would indeed attack you, sting you. 
And here is a, one of our, <clears throat> excuse me, our largest robber flies, our Cholesterus magnificus, and it has captured one of the uh, um, polistes, and it uses its legs, like you can see right there, almost like a table to hold the uh, polistes in place while it drains it. And so here we go to another common species. And this is over by Green Valley. This is Polistes flavus. And uh, when times get hard, you know, maybe in a drought or it's towards the end of the, the season, it's starting to get cold, the uh, adults can't find enough prey, then they will take the immatures out and cannibalize. They will eat the immatures. And here you see Polistes flavus. And Polistes flavus, when you see a wasp, and I'm sure that all of us have because we're interested in nature, you'll see them gliding or resting on a water. And what they're usually doing is bringing that water into their crop, which they're going to use then to, uh, with that fibers that they collect to build their nest. And here, Pseudomothoca, Propinqua, and this is a mutilid. This is a um, commonly called a velvet ant. And this is a female that just came out of a digger bee's nest, a cactus bee, diadasia species. And they are parasitic, kleptoparasitic. They will lay their eggs in uh, the cells, and then they, they will devour the immature uh, cactus bee. And here we all see the tarantula hawks, pepsis species, all the large tarantula hawks are pepsis species. And here it is with the tarantula. I have another picture that I probably should have put in there, but you actually see the uh, wasp st sting the uh, tarantula. And here we have, uh, I made a mistake on this one. It's, Triscolia ardens, and it's a male. And uh, these are called flower wasps. These are big and heavy bodied, relatively heavy bodied wasps. This is a male. And um, they're very good pollinators. You can see that this is on Calistromia, uh, Stromia, whatever, uh, one they call Arizona poppy. And um, you can see all the pollen grains and it makes total and absolute contact with the stigmas with all that pollen. And uh, yeah, another interesting thing about the males of, of the, what are called the scolides uh, is that they have a false sting, what's called a pseudo sting. And you can actually see it at the very tip end. It has like three, if it was magnified, uh, projections that stick out. And so if something grabs a hold of it, whether it's a lizard, a mouse, or whatever it may be, or a person, it, go, it will jab that into you. And you, you don't stop to think, well, if that's a female or male, you just let it go. No. And then to get the idea between what are aculeate wasps and what are not, now this is a very ancient group of wasps. This is Tremex columba, and it, it is a, a wood wasp, and it's put in that group that are called soft flies. The most soft flies, uh, anyway. Uh, you can see that black segment that goes straight into this. This is a aspen and she lays her eggs. Her egg travels through that black tube into the wood. And uh, the part that is brown and it sticks upright close to her abdomen, that's simply the sheath that the ovipositor, the black part, will fit into when she's not laying an egg, which is most of the time, of course. And a stinging wasp, the aculeate hymenop, ants, wasps, and bees, they, they do not lay any eggs. The females do not lay any eggs through the uh, ovipositor, which is now called a sting. And it's used mainly for their protection. And here is a harvester ant nest. And this is in the San Pedro down one of the regular trails where I walk a lot. And uh, there's a couple of things that are really interesting about these. And you can look it up in the literature. Um, some people might find it hard to grasp that uh, 
the queens, and here's the queen ant, uh, Pogon Miramex barbatus, and the queens are known to live uh, anywhere from 30 to 45 years. Mm. And so we think it's really great when we hear, you know, the 17 year cicada makes all the news. And so, of course, there's, you know, masses of them that come out. And we think, well, that's really long lived, but that's nothing at all compared to many species, different species of ants. And ants are a favorite subject in lots of laboratories and so on. So there's all kinds of, you know, stories about ants. Usually not in laboratories, they seldom live that long, but they're still, you know, will have different, many different species of ants in laboratories that live 20 years or longer. The queens, that is. Workers of some species will live, uh, can live two or three years. Now, here's a worker, here's a Pogon Miramux barbatus. And here's another worker. And this one is clearing the vegetation away from the opening. And one of the reasons that they believe that they clear all this vegetation out is because some of their predators are various species of uh, spiders. And if the spider has nowhere to lay down its you know, web and so on, then they're pretty much spider free by clearing that vegetation out. <laughs> and here we have a wasp, Clepidon, with a, a worker, Pogon Miramex barbatus. And the, these wasps prey upon um, these ants and they will place in a cell that's called mass provisioning 16 to 26 uh, ants and lay one egg on them. And then, of course they make more than one cell. Um, and at the tail end, you can see that the um, terminal segments, so to speak of the abdomen are highly modified. And it has uh, what's called, it has evolved what is called an ant clamp. And it is able to insert that like right here between the bases of the legs. And that way all, all six of its legs, the wasp legs are free and then it can take it into the nest like that. Hmm. And here I probably shouldn't even include this. This is a picture of a starting of the nest of the Pogana Miramax Maricopa, which has the worst sting of any uh, uh, insect in uh, Arizona. And here is the queen uh, that before she's taken flight, this is uh, <clears throat> Pogon Merimex queen, Maricopa. And that's uh, when you see a light, really light colored ant like that. I mean, there are species that are light colored, but when the other individuals are darker color or whatever, that's usually means that it's what we call a callow. So it's a young, it's just one that's just been out, you know, uh, enclosed from its uh, pupa, whatever for, maybe one or two days, it gradually changes to the color of the rest of the ants. <clears throat> and uh, here's another one that uh, Pogano Merimex californicus. And here you had two different ants for the same nest. And ants are really, really strange little creatures, but uh, this one thought it was going to help the other one. And the other one slap, hits it in the face. <laughs> and just like a little kid or something, you have to see these things to believe. So it takes off and runs back to the nest. And the other one just picks it up, minds its own business, and takes the, <laughs> takes it's a immature, um, oh, what do you call it, a beetle, um, tiger beetle, immature, larval stage, pupa or pupil stage. And ants are famous for fighting, they're very territorial. And uh, here we have uh, Ogana Merimex Maricopa, a noble messer, albacitosis. And uh, anyway, they uh, the, the, are territorial, but they only seem to fight to a degree. And they, usually they get along fairly well if you really watch them, you know. Um, but what ants are famous for, as far as when it comes to fighting, is when they uh, interact with their own species. And so then they will just slaughter each other, a lot, most species. And here's mm -hmm. this one here, and it's between a rock and a hard place anyway. Um, Maricopa is stinging the uh, 
albicitosis in the underside of the head. Another interesting thing here is that there's something like 36 species of approximately of uh, desert ants globally uh, that have what are called a samaphore. Samaphore, you can see underneath the head of the ant and uh, are hairs and also on the bottoms of the mandibles and that helps them, uh, they can pick up sand and carry it back up when they're making their nests and so on. And uh, Nova Messer <clears throat> oftentimes, but not always, will have a nest by the edge of a rock. And here's one, and he's kind of looking out, wondering, what are you doing? And here is a series. Some ants are much quicker than others and much more complex and agile. And we have a big, this is a large rubber fly, Promatia species. And it's got some kind of hemiptron. It's just landed there and it's taking its time. It's going to uh, drain the uh, prey item. And all of a sudden, and this is very quick. I wasn't expecting this. And here comes the albicitosis and it grabs, it just runs directly like it knows exactly what it's doing. Just like you saw a turn trying to steal something from another turn or whatever, you know, and it grabs the hemiptron and it just yanks it and turns around and runs right back off the rock. And so what you have is this one is in a state of shock. <laughs> it's got nothing left except the hemiptron's head and which is not really edible. And there's no uh, nourishment there. No. And now here you have another Promatus, same species, and it's captured uh, probably an agapostem and a bee. Uh, and you have different insects feeding on it. And one of them happens to be a Pogonum myrmex barbatus. And over here you, on the side of the ant, you can see the claws. And, when you're watching this, all of a sudden, it just shoves the ant completely off. And so, albicitosis, the Nova Messer, to my way, just from my observation, is much more agile, much quicker. And they also do something that the Pogo and Merrimax never do to any real degree. And that's that several of them can pick up a prey item and run with it. I mean, literally and navigate very quickly and agilely back to the nest. And Pogon Miramax doesn't do that, not to that degree. And here in Costa Rica, that last year, year before last, and these would come to the light. Uh, this is San Ramon, Costa Rica. And this is a queen, um, uh, leaf cutter ant, but it's, uh, there are several different species. This is Columbia, I might have spelled that wrong, Columbia or Columbica. And um, here's a worker in that same yard, but this is a totally different species and it's cutting the leaf. And what the leaf cutters do, and we have a leaf cutter here, like well, see, they don't eat the vegetation that they take back to the nest. They simply use that to farm their fungus. They raise, uh, fungus and <clears throat> just like little mushroom heads and that's what they live off of. And, and they use different types of uh, vegetation. You usually see any pictures about uh, Atta, the uh, big leaf cutter ants with leaves, but this one is taking a uh, banana, a plantain pieces back and it will do the same thing. It won't eat the banana, but it will eat, uh, use it to grow its gardens. And here's the, uh, the nest, we'll see these Aquamerimex versicolor, and they're very common in the San Pedro. And uh, sometimes you'll see several nests, sometimes maybe three or four feet apart that, are, uh, that will go to the same underground nest. And here's a pair that are mating. I got camped out in the desert over by Green Valley once and early in the morning, there were just clouds of these coming and I got, this photograph on the hood of my truck. And it took me a couple hours just to clean it up to get it because there was so much debris and so on. 
And this is the queen of the Acromyramix versicolor. The other interesting thing is that this particular species, they oftentimes will found a new colony, uh, maybe two, three or more queens. And then eventually what happens according to literature is that the uh, workers will kill all the queens except one. And this one is just taking an old queen out to the dump. Mm. <laughs> and they, uh, here's another Acromyramix, versicolor worker just bringing back a, a dead flower of a desert willow. And now we come to the bees and this is mm. Andrena and uh, Seracifolia. And um, this is the female and they're also called minor bees. And uh, they are some of the major ones as far as when you go out and you look at our manzanitas, Arthrostophilus, pungens, whatever, you'll see that little holes on the sides and uh, Andrena will make those holes. And I don't know if there's that many other bees that do, I don't think so. And the other bees will, uh, and even things like butter, little butterflies, little blues will use those holes to access nectar. And here you have a, a bee that's accessing the nectar, and this is no matter, this is a parasitic, kleptoparasitic bee, and uh, they will lay their eggs in the nest of Andren. It's different species. And, um, and here you have yet another uh, kleptoparasitic, but it's quite different in its biology. And uh, it's in the family collectidae with the, uh, what they call in England, furrow bees. Uh, anyway, what it's doing is here is feeding on a honeydew secreted nectar type substance secreted by the aphids. And here you have a pair of uh, Osmia, these are native bees, uh, Osmia foxi, and um, they're quite rare. You don't, they, they're not out very long. Dang. And here you have Osmia palmula, which has a really small range. It's probably quite endangered. We have it on the edges of the, the Bachucas and so on. I don't know how much further it extends. Uh, I've never seen a female. Well, that's, and now because of all the roadside damage, that's what I call it, the scraping and the pesticide use in places like Coronado National Monument and so on, you see less and less of these bees. And here you have Osmia ribiflorus, vitamin I, and she's on a manzanita leaf. So they go to a number of different kinds of flowers and so on, but they're especially attractive to the manzanitas. And she's make, she, you can see it here in the front leg. She makes a bowl, it's a ball. And she will fly with that back to her nest, which is a linear series, and, and usually in wood. And she will use that for cell partitions. And she will make several cells. And uh, anyway, and here's one entering a nest. This was a man-made nest. It's easy to get these, um, to get a variety of different bees to go into uh, nesting holes. And then you have one of my favorites is a, a pygon. And this is a female and they're very interesting. They uh, will go into the nest. They're very sneaky, They'll wait and very nervous acting. And try to see a female osmia leave the nest, this is an osmia nest, and uh, they will go in there and then lay their egg. And another interesting thing, and maybe that's why they have such big antenna, but if an osmia catches them in there, then they will come out minus several segments on the antenna. Here's a very fast flying bee. This is Eucera atribentris, and it's, um, unless it lands here, might not really get a chance to see it, but it's quite common in Miller Canyon and so on here in the Huachucas. And here's a, lar a large bee, uh, 
and this was this is really a drought season, a drought year here. Um, but this one is sleeping. And male bees oftentimes will clamp onto vegetation and and sleep there. And here's one that's right there at the gate at uh, Ramsey Canyon uh, Preserve, whatever, and uh, it's feeding on the uh, Arctic, the uh, Manzanita flowers. And here's a Helictus on Manzanita. And here's a Lazy Oglossum on an Apuntia. And some Helictus, some uh, Lazy Oglossum are um, social to a degree. And some females of some of these will live for several years. And here at the Fora California, because you can't mistake this one once you see that hind leg and so on. And it's a, um, a ground nesting bee. And it's a, they, they scent mark everything. So it attracts, I believe, the females. And uh, the males are territorial, but not overly aggressive like some types. And here's one close close up on a salvia flower. And here's the female. That's another interesting thing. And the young when the young females are first uh, you and it's early in the season, so to speak, you won't uh, you will see them come to the flowers sometimes for several days with no pollen at all. That's because they're in the process of making a nest to start with. They would have no place to put the pollen until their nests are completed. And sometimes that might take on some species several days. And here you have Anthidium maculosum. And this is a male and he's guarding a patch of uh, little flowers. And, uh, and they are different. And here's the face of that male. Um, the females come out, usually the male bees come out before the females, and but not with anthidium. All the anthidium uh, females come out before the males, so the males get to sleep in. And, but the males are quite territorial. And here's their uh, fighting uh, apparatus. They'll come at each other in a C shape and will clash and fight for dominance. And here's the female on a salvia. And you could give this one a common name, it'd be uh, their wool carter bees. And this, you could say the spotted wool carter bee. And there's the female. And she simply, her mandible, she just strips the uh, tomatum or whatever, you know, uh, so to speak, like down like material off of the leaves. And she will make uh, a ball of that and she will form her cell and uh, a nice, usually white, uh, fluffy package. And here's a, a Baba Sonoris queen. Uh, you'll see these coming out pretty soon. And they overwinter, so this will be a new queen just starting her nest. And here, later, much later in the season, you'll have the males. And the mills are quite uh, territorial also, and they will fight. And this one is not so good in this particular picture, but it's already lost one of its antenna. And here is a uh, one of the bees that I saw out today. I saw several males, no females yet. And this is Ilocopa californicus arizonensis. And um, here she's on a monarda, and this was in the Fort Huachuca, anyway, several years ago, and she's got uh, prickly poppy pollen on her legs, but the Monarda flower has a different strategy. As far as I'm concerned, uh, uh, it takes and just completely covers the uh, uh, pollinators in pollen. And what it, so that uh, when they go to another plant, they don't, you know, that, that is the pollen that will make contact with another monarda and fertilize it. And I don't know if anything's written about that, but that's, that's what they're doing. And here is a Xylocopa, Cal Arizona, Nensis, Californicus male. And you can tell uh, them by their big eyes. 
and this is nectar thievery. It's going up to the salvia and thrust its head into the corolla, the, what do you call it? The corolla, the back of the corolla, and it will get nectar there. There's no, there's no way that the bee can fit into the tubular flower. And here you have another interesting carpenter bee. This is a female Xylocopa viripuncta. Here you have the male. So they're sexually dimorphic. Not only are they sexually dimorphic, now they've done studies on this one in the last few years and find out that the males have these, that they can generate these uh, scents and so on. And uh, they're from their thorax, and which is supposed to attract females, but anyway. And that's on Senna. Also, if you have just about any kind of Senna in your yard, you will get interesting bees. Uh, especially that we have some nocturnal bees that are, will go to Senna. Uh, any, questions? Any, any questions? I'm sorry. How about your camera? What kind of camera are you using? I use a couple of different kinds of cameras that I have for years. I use Canon and Nikon. And the reason for that is that uh, Canon makes a lens that uh, we used to use it at USDA in Fort Collins, but it, it, it is a macro lens that I use in, out in the field, but it starts at life size and it goes to five times life size. Oh, yeah. And I then, that one. other than that, I use Nikon <laughs> cameras and uh, usually a 200 millimeter macro lens, which they no longer even make. This is Cato. I have a question. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> when an ant attacks you, does it sting you or does it bite you? Well, it could do both. And there are some ants, you know, from micro species that, that uh, bite you and then they spray you. They don't really sting you. But for the most part, most of our desert ants, especially the ones that you're liable to come into contact with would be Pogano Miramex and they, they can sting. And Maricopa, I was, had the interesting experience of getting stung by one of those. And it's so painful and it's so bad, but it's very, at the same time, so different that your skin in that immediate area will sweat. Not only does your skin sweat it, you know, you can wipe it off, you can see the sweat, and then that hair in that immediate area stands completely erect. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's well known. And uh, we have- So you said, you said it sprays? No, no, that, that's a different ant, no, okay. Okay, but ants can spray venom? Yes, certain species do that, but you might not know Thank what's you. happening, you know, but it's, uh, very quite small, like a lot of ants are, and they would might pinch you with the mandibles and then spray you. And the spray, that's where you get formic acid, the idea of formic acid. Right, uh, of course. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. And yes, your photography is spectacular. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bob, um, what's the situation regarding fire ants in Arizona? Uh, I, I really can't answer that. Solenopsis, um, actually most of them I can identify the species, but I, I don't know what, what's happening with uh, fire ants. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I suppose that you would go onto the internet and maybe even uh, make contact if possible with the USDA yeah and get information there. Um, and that's another thing that also for ant identification and ant information, they have a great uh, website, it's called Ant Wiki, one word. And what is that again? Ant, uh, it's A-N-T-W-I-K-I. -I. And there you go. Yes. And another one for people, I'll go ahead and say, and that's, you might not know of, most people do, and that's Bug Guide. Bug Guide, you can identify, I mean, they're not 
just ants, they, you know, just about any kind of an insect. Yeah, that's a great resource, I know. <clears throat> you said, was that bug guy or bug guide? One word again, <laughs> B-U-G-G-U-I-D-E. Okay, yeah, that one I use. Yeah, yeah Bob is the bug guy. <laughs> Get it? Okay. okay. Actually, they just fascinate me because they're so small and all I've ever really been interested in is their behavior. <laughs> but you got to do what you got to do to make money. So. <laughs> well, thanks again, Bob. <laughs>